All right, good morning, Three Circle Church. Before we go to our campuses, I want to talk to the Fairhope campus for just a minute. We have Easter coming up, right? And we're excited about it. In fact, we'll put the Easter schedule up right now. Here is our Easter schedule. And, and I just want to kind of let y'all know the lay of the land at Easter that happens every year. And it just continues to happen as our church continues to grow and God continues to bless our church. It, it is harder every year at Easter to figure out how to get everybody in, okay? And uh, so we try to do that the best we can. And I want to tell you some ways you can help us this year, all right? And here's one way. One way you could do it is by, in Jesus' name, not coming to this particular service time, okay? I'm just being honest with you. Because we have offered a bunch of other great options. Now, you will see here that Good Friday, those are unique services that we hope all of you will come to those. But once Saturday starts, every single gathering is identical in teaching and worship and music. You're not going to miss anything. And so here's the thing. I promise you Jesus will be glorified if you come on Saturday. He really will. He really rose from the grave, and you can sing about that on Saturday. So we have these amazing Saturday gatherings that will be they'll be awesome, okay? And also there's special things for your family, so that is a really cool thing. But then when we roll over to Sunday, let's say you're one of those folks, and I get it. You're like, no, Jesus rose from the grave on Sunday. That's when I'm going to church. Okay, I got you. All right? So what we've done is we've given, instead of these... 9, 30, and 11 hours, these prime hours that are going to be so packed because this place is going to be crazy at this time. I'm just letting you know that if you came to the 8 o'clock gathering, it'd be huge, but we've also added a sunrise. So if you really want to be pure and you really want to be authentic, <laughs> Jesus got up early that day, y'all. Let's be honest. If you want to go down that road, you need to get up early too. Get your family here. It is a family gathering. So at 6.30, there won't be kids stuff. It'll all be families in this room. We want to fill it up at 630 for the sunrise, but that gathering's identical to the others. So you don't want to come to sunrise and then come to the others because you thought it was different. They're the same, all right? 638. Now, let's say you're here and you go, man, this is just my hour. This is when I like to come. That's cool. That's cool. Or you go 11 o'clock. That's cool. It's fine. I just want to warn you, if you come to this hour, you may show up and see a sign like this that says, the grave is empty, but this room is full, all right? <laughs> Just giving you a heads up. That could happen, all right? And if it does, we're going to take you to a land, a beautiful land, a wonderful land. It's called overflow. And this is not like in the Old Testament where it's overflowing with milk and honey, the promised land. Overflow is where you go, and there will be worship, and there will be teaching. There'll be those things, but it will not be in this room. And it'll be because the grave is empty, but this room is full. Okay, now, now listen. If you come, I just want you to be able to go, well, he told us so, all right? He told us it might be this way. And so we're trying to help everyone seriously. I'm having a little fun with it. But if you can help us with that in any way, you can look on your handout. There's a little QR code. This is not you reserving a spot. But if you go there, you can let us know if you're planning on going to what, whatever hour. And, and we want you to invite all your friends there, too. And the reason I want you to come to some other hours, because I'm hoping you're all going to bring all your friends, and I want them to be able to get in the room, and I want us to be able to make it happen. A lot of guests are going to end up coming to this 9, 30, and 11, okay? And we're going to try to make it work for everybody, but as many of us as can come to the others will be a huge help, and that's all of us just working together. And, of course, we want you to go where you want to go. So the fact that you'll come and bring your friends is huge. But if you'll go on that little QR code thing and just let us know, all of you that do, that will help us to just kind of get in our mind, hey, here's what's happening, here's what we're looking at. Thank you all. You're amazing, and it's going to be an amazing Easter, okay? Yes, it is. I got one person excited, and, uh, and I'm assuming that all, all of you who clapped, I'll see y'all at 8 o'clock and 6.30 next, uh, on that Sunday morning. Let's dive into the Word, all right? Let's go to 1 Peter. We're in storm shelter, and Peter is writing this letter to churches who are going through a storm, and the storm's going to get worse. And the idea that we're going to get into today is Peter's going to come to the point today where he's going to acknowledge the fact that suffering is a part of the Christian life, and these churches are experiencing suffering. So what do we do with that? It's an age-old philosophical question. What are we going to do with suffering? And there's different angles on it. We're going to take a biblical angle today. The modern Americana prosperity theology that has come about over the past 50, 60 years in prominence is the fact that Christians, if they suffer, well, they must not have enough faith. That, that if you had enough faith, you wouldn't suffer. And, and I just want you to know that that's just not the Bible. 
That's a whole nother gospel. It's not the biblical gospel at all. Because Peter and John and Paul and James, they, they suffered. So what Peter does is he does not shy away from it. And today we're going to get a treatment on suffering and what that looks like. And what we're going to learn today is storms meant to destroy us can instead make us stronger in Christ. That's going to be the big idea that we get out of this today. Storms can make us stronger. I lived in Pensacola, uh, church planting in Florida for a while, and, and we experienced Hurricane Ivan. And when Hurricane Ivan hit in 2003, I think it was, it was the worst storm that Pensacola had been hit with in over 100 years. And it may be, it's definitely one of the worst in its history. And at the time, you would think this is the worst thing ever. But 20 years later, few would argue that Hurricane Ivan did not, in the long run, actually make that town better. Because it removed a bunch of stuff that needed to go. It opened the door to some stuff. And now there's like a really cool blue Wahoo Stadium and downtown's cool. And well, I pro it was not that way before. Uh, and, and, and things change. So things that look like they're so destructive in the long run can make us stronger. And that's true of suffering in our own lives. I grew up on a farm where everyone around me could grow stuff, and I didn't get that at all. Like, plants come to my house to die a slow death because I'm not good at growing stuff. I kill stuff. That's what happens. But we do try to cheat a little bit. My good buddy Cecil here in town taught me one time. He was like, hey, you know what a guy like you needs? A guy who grew up on a farm but didn't learn any of it. You need some of this stuff right here. And maybe you've heard of it. It's called miracle Grow. And so what we do to, to slow down the death process, at least at our house, is we use miracle Grow in the potting mix. And we like this stuff too. This is uh, plant food, all-purpose miracle Grow. And what I want to tell you today is that God has miracle Grow for his people. You're not going to like it, though. miracle Grow is suffering. That's God's miracle Grow, his fertilizer is suffering. It does what nothing else can. It speeds up your growth like nothing else can. So with all that in mind, let's dive in and let Peter tell us how we deal with the miracle grow of our faith. First Peter 3, 13 to 17, he says this, now who is there to harm you if you are zealous for what is good? But even if you should suffer for righteousness sake, don't miss this church, if you should suffer for righteousness sake, you will be blessed. Have no fear of them, nor be troubled. Don't, don't be afraid of suffering. Verse 15, but in your hearts, honor Christ the Lord as holy, always being prepared to make a defense to anyone who asks you for a reason for the hope that is in you. Yet do it with gentleness and respect, having a good conscience, so that when you are slandered, those who revile your good behavior in Christ may be put to shame. For it is better to suffer for doing good, if that should be God's will, than for doing evil. Now let's dive in, and what we're going to do is we're going to come to the last verse, verse 17, in that section, work ourselves back up, okay? The first thing you see here in verse 17 is that Peter offers us a concept that's very important. He gives you two types of suffering. He says, there is suffering that God brings into your life, God wills it, and you'll be blessed for that. That's a good thing. But he says there's another type of suffering, and it's for doing evil, and so what we see here, you want to write it down, is self-inflicted suffering should be avoided, but God-ordained suffering should be leveraged. Now let's talk about what he means here. There's two types of suffering, and you don't need to get them mixed up. And think about this. He's telling a church that's under persecution, he never stops challenging them. He does not pamper this church. He lets them know that it'd be real easy for them to mix in consequences that, that it's just because they're sinning, they're not following God in an area of their lives, and just act like all of that is persecution from Nero. He's like, don't play that game. There's two types of suffering. There's your self-inflicted suffering, and there's suffering that is God-willed. One is a blessing. One you need to avoid. You need to repent. You need to go to the Lord with that. Let me give you an example, talking about storms, because Peter was the weatherman, right? He was telling the church the storm of persecution is on its way, and we all deal with the storms of suffering. So as a kid growing up, my dad was a police officer and then a firefighter, both of those being emergency personnel. When the hurricanes would hit South Mississippi, like they do in here, along the Gulf Coast, he was always on call. He was always a part of that. And here's how it would work. My dad would always tell these stories. So what would happen is 
they would, days ahead of time, the authorities would say, hey, here's where the storm's going to hit, and these areas need to evacuate. They're called evacuation notices, right? They begin to let people know, if you live down on this bayou, down on this river, because there's a lot of that down here on the Gulf Coast, you need to get out of there. But my dad would always say, there's always, you know, old Bayou Bob down there that decides that he's not going anywhere. And he always ends up on the news. You know, the cameras go out, and that's who they're going to get on the news for the country to see. And Bayou Bob gets on there, and he's like, man, I'll tell you what, I'm not going anywhere, man. I ain't, I ain't leaving for a storm. My whole family's been on this bayou my whole life. Me and my lady, we're going to make a big pot of gumbo. We're going to fry some shrimp and some oysters, play Scrabble all night. We ain't going anywhere. The government ain't going to make us leave. I'll tell you that right now. And my dad always had a joke that about midnight, when the 150-mile-an-hour winds start, it's going to be Bayou Bob calling the calling the station going, hey, can y'all come get me out of here, man? It's getting bad down here. We need some help. And he can't help him then. Why? Because the emergency people will put out this thing, this announcement that says, the storm has now gotten too bad and it's too dangerous for our people to go out. Our people will not be going out anymore until after the storm. Now, Bayou Bob is now going to experience self-inflicted suffering. He's going to suffer all night, and I hope that gumbo is good, and I hope he wins that game of Scrabble because he's going to spend eight hours wondering if his house is going to wash away because he would not evacuate. Now, he can't blame that on the emergency officials, and he can't say, I was just fighting the good fight. He, No, no, no. He made a bad decision, and he suffered because of it. So what Peter is saying is, hey, don't Listen, don't mistreat your spouse for 10 years and end up with a really unhealthy marriage and then act like you're being attacked by Satan and you're suffering. No, Satan didn't attack you. You weren't a good spouse for 10 years. Don't blame it on him. You are self-inflicting suffering into your life. Does that make sense, church? So there's that thing that we have to repent of and avoid. But, but Peter says to all of us and the church, he says, but when you're just following God and stuff comes into your life, that is God willed. You didn't choose that. It came. It will come. And he says, you don't have to be afraid of that. You can actually go, thank you, Lord. And Christians stop asking, watch this, Christians mature to the point where we stop asking God, why is this happening? And we start going, God, what are you doing in my life? Because I didn't choose this, so it must be you allowing it. How are you going to use this miracle grow? What are you teaching me in my life. God-ordained suffering should be leveraged. So let's talk for a moment. You can write this in the margins if you want or just hear it, but what are some ways in which suffering helps us? I want to give you a few. How is suffering good? How is it miracle grow? Number one, suffering, and by the way, I've personally experienced all these. I'm in the boat with you. Suffering drives us to God in a way that nothing else does. It drives up the intensity of my prayer life. It drives me to my knees. How many of you have experienced that? When you go through things that are bigger than you, it drives you to your knees. Secondly, I think that suffering humbles us. It humbles us. It's a good thing for people who have a tendency like we all do to think we're bigger than what we're dealing with. When we realize it's over our head, we suddenly are humbled. And when we get small, we can finally see that our God is big. That's a really good perspective. That's not a bad thing. That's a good thing. That's miracle grow. Thirdly, it breaks like nothing else can. It breaks our addiction to self-reliance. We are self-reliant people. We think that our money can make it happen, our ability to work, our ability to make things happen in our lives, that that's what's going to get us through. And suffering, when it gets big enough that your money can't handle it and your experience can't handle it and your connections can't handle it and it, and it, it just hits you, that's when you go, oh my goodness, I can't rely on myself. I need God, and you needed him all along. It's just that suffering shined a light on it. Church, Christians, listen, that's not a bad thing. That's a really good thing when that happens. It also enables us to, and don't miss this, this is nuanced, but if you grab it, you can really grab it. It enables you as a Christian to experience God's comfort because as long as you can fix everything, then you are comforting yourself. The only way a Christian can experience the sweet comfort 
that only God can bring is when you get to the end of your ability to comfort yourself. At the end of your ability to fix everything is the first time you get to experience God's comfort and provision in your life. And that's a really good thing. That's a really good thing. That's not a bad thing. That's miracle grow. When you realize there's things in your life that you can't handle, but he can. That's a good place to get. That's when your faith becomes real. And then finally, the book of James tells us that all suffering in the Christian life produces endurance. In other words, it makes you stronger. It just makes you stronger. That is why suffering should not be feared by the Christian. He also says here, before we got to verse 17, remember we'll work ourselves backwards for a moment. He says, we need to be ready to defend our faith to anyone who asks us, and we should do it with gentleness and respect. Y'all, we could do a sermon series on this. There's a lot to learn here, and here's a few things. Number one, that word defense is a Greek word, and it's where we get the idea of apologetics. So defense is apologetics, and it means that we must develop our ability to articulate our faith. That's what Peter is saying, and he does not say this is just for extroverts. It's for introverts too. If you're an extrovert, then loudly articulate your faith. If you're an introvert, whisper it, but, but articulate it. Be who you are, but speak. Brennan Manning, one of my favorite authors, wrote a lot of great things, but there's one quote that I always wrestle with where he said, and it's the one most often quoted, uh, preach the gospel everywhere in all places at all times and when necessary, use words. And I always want to go, it's necessary, use your words. We've been given words on purpose. We're humans. God gave us language. We are to use our language. I would ask this today. How, when's the last time you as a Christian here and at all of our campuses, when's the last time you articulated your faith to someone in any way? When, when's the last time you walked through a door? Now, here's the thing that I think is brilliant from Peter. Peter not only tells us we must articulate our faith, he tells us how we must. Don't you dare be proud about it. Don't, you should be what? Gentle and respectful. Respectful of what? The person you're talking to. You're not going to win anyone to Jesus by being mean and just trying to prove that you're right. I knew I wouldn't get a lot of amens on that because, well, it's our culture, right? No, he says the way we should do it. And by the way, how tempted do you think the Christians around Rome were if a Roman came up to them and said, hey, tell me why you believe what you believe. Don't you think those Christians wanted to go off? Like, oh, I'll tell you why. I'll tell you why, because you're evil, and your people are evil, and y'all are all evil. You're terrible. And if I could, I'd go on Roman Facebook and blow you up. I'll just use my Roman TikTok account. It erases every time I put something. You can't trace it. You know, we'll, we'll just do it however we can. No, no, Peter says to that church, he says, you be ready to articulate your faith and you do it in a way that is kind and respectful. Man, what a challenge. Peter had learned his lessons because this is the guy who cut the dude's ear off trying to arrest Jesus. You remember that? I mean, he's, he's come a long way here, y'all. This is Peter saying, here's how we must defend our faith. And defending your faith does not, but Jesus doesn't need you to defend him, just so you know. The defense of the faith here, the idea is that you're able to articulate. Well, here's what we believe about suffering. Here's what we believe about this world. Here's what I believe about you as a human. Here's what I believe about you Romans, you Gentiles. We believe you're made in the image of God, so we love you and we serve you. I don't agree with you, but I care about you and I must serve you. The same Bible that tells me that I can't agree with everything you do as a Roman citizen also demands that I love you and serve you and lay my life down for you. The same Bible tells me that. So we must articulate our faith. And then Peter says this in verse 18, one powerful verse that has theological implications. He says, for Christ also suffered. So he suffered, we will too, but he suffered once for sins, the righteous for the unrighteous, that he might bring us to God, being put to death in the flesh, but made alive in the spirit. What's going on here? This is a gospel verse. Peter, being an Old Testament guy, talking to an Old Testament Jewish audience primarily still, he's telling them, hey, 
Every sacrifice you made, all those years, all those sacrificial systems, Jesus did with one sacrifice. With one. You can write it down. The one-time sacrifice of Jesus accomplished what all other sacrifices could not. And this is a point because I think Peter meant this to be a point where the church reading the letter would just think for a minute about how great Jesus is. So we should do the same. What's he getting at here? Well, this audience would have known. These people who have come to faith in Christ understand the revolutionary aspect of the gospel because up until that time, they had to go through a very difficult, bloody, arduous, hard system to approach God. It was sacrificial. Lambs had to be raised. You had to bring the lambs in, and someone had to have a knife and kill the lambs. So the lobby of the church, if we were in the ancient world, would be bloody. Your kids would have to see all that, deal with all that. We would have to deal with all that before we could approach the holy God. And those people knew they had come out of that. And so Peter's reminding them that all of those sacrifices, as hard and bloody as they were, never actually accomplished the thing that they were symbolizing. It just kicked the can of sin a little further down the road. But he says, Jesus, with one bloody sacrifice, did what they all could not do, and there never has to be another one. And now when you come to church, you're not out there killing a lamb. You get to fix a cup of coffee before you come in. And then you get to come in and just worship. You walk straight to the throne. You don't need CB here or anybody else to help you get to God. You don't have to come through me. You get to go straight to him. Why? Because the blood shed on Calvary one time did what the blood for every other lamb never could do. And that is gospel right there. That's the gospel. So he meant for us to celebrate that. Peter wanted in the middle of this letter for us to see the suffering of Christ and what it produced, what it has produced for us. Aren't you thankful for Jesus? And so Peter says, he did what no other lamb could do. He brought us to God. And then he put to death He was put to death in the flesh, but he was made alive in the spirit. Now, this is about to get quite mysterious. Y'all remember the movie Wizard of Oz? As a kid, we watched it every year. The scariest thing about that thing was not the witch. It was the tornado. That tornado was scary for me. I had nightmares, not about the witch, the tornado. But you remember at the end of the movie, you've got the tin man, the lion, the scarecrow, and Dorothy with her red glittery shoes. And, you, and they finally get to the wizard, and the wizard's on a screen. But you remember how smart Toto was? Toto's a smart dog, man. And Toto's like, something, something's not right here. He looks over, and you see Toto. He runs over there to that curtain, and he peels back the curtain. You remember? And all of a sudden, you see something that you'd never seen. You saw what was behind the curtain. Peter is going to pull back the curtain a little bit on the spiritual world here for just a minute. And it's going to... Be awesome and also mysterious. Like he doesn't spend a lot of time explaining it. We're going to here for a moment. And we're going to take our time for just a minute to see what is Peter talking about. Okay. So to get this right, in the verse before he says, Jesus was put to death in the flesh but made alive in the spirit. In other words, when Jesus died, his his spirit was still very much alive. And something happened. Verse 19 through 22. In which, his spirit, in which he went and proclaimed to the spirits in prison because they formerly did not obey when God's patience waited in the days of Noah while the ark was being prepared, in which a few, that is eight persons, were brought safely through water. Baptism, which corresponds to this, now saves you not as a removal of dirt from the body, but as an appeal to God for a good conscience. Through the resurrection of Jesus Christ, who has gone into heaven, is is at the right hand of God with angels, authorities, and powers having been subjected to him. I love that, the authority of Christ. Okay, so let's dive in. What's going on here? The first thing we see Peter saying, to just pull some of the mystery out, is is that he wants you to get a picture in your mind of three things. Noah, don't miss this, the whole thing's glued together with this analogy he's making. Noah, Noah's ark, and the days of Noah. Now here's what we know about the days of Noah. Peter's comparing these two things. 
And he's saying, in the days of Noah, it was so wicked. We know this. It's so wicked that in the end times, it's compared to the apocalyptic end is compared to the days of Noah, like the days of Noah. The demonic presence was so outrageous that God, they literally, it looks like, overshot their lines and God literally imprisoned many, many of the demonic forces, imprisoned them. And what Peter is saying is, is that when Jesus died on the cross, he went and declared his victory to demonic forces who were imprisoned since the days of Noah. Now, this is mysterious. And you say to me, well, Chris, how did all that work? And I'm going to give you the Greek term for it. I don't know how that worked. And Peter doesn't spend a lot of time. He just wants you to know, I think, that Jesus took a victory lap. I like that. That Jesus goes into places that we can't even imagine and one day we'll understand. And he said, you thought you had me. I just want you to know that I am undoing everything you've done and I have the keys and I have the authority and even death can't stop me. You cannot stop what's happening right now. You, you, you had no idea what was going to happen when I died and it has set into motion a plan we've had all along. And I just want you to know. I kind of like that. Do y'all like that? I kind of like that. I got four or five other people excited. That's all I need. It's all I need to keep going, all right? And so, so Jesus declared his victory, but now we get to a better point, a bigger point, because he wants you to see the ark, and he gives you an explanation. Don't think this is saying baptism saves someone. Baptism does not save people. Baptism does not make you a Christian. Baptism does not make you more of a Christian. Baptism is a symbol of our faith like this wedding ring is for me. If I take my wedding band off, I've been married to Nan Bell for 23 years. If I take my wedding ring off, am I still a, uh, am I still a Christian? Am I, st- I am still a Christian. Am I still married to Nan if I take my wedding ring off? Yes. Because the wedding ring doesn't make me married. It just tells you I am. That's baptism. Baptism tells people that we are believers publicly. So what is Peter saying here? Well, you've got to understand the analogy. He says that the ark, when Noah built the ark, it was baptized, if you will, meaning immersed in what? Water. And that water was what? That water was the wrath of God. It was the judgment of God on a sinful world. But eight people who got in that boat, the ark, were saved from what? The wrath of God. Don't miss this. Modern world doesn't like to hear this. They were saved from the wrath of God. And what he's saying is, What the ark did, as great as it was, is it it saved those eight people temporarily, just physically saved them. He's saying, Jesus, write it down, Jesus is the greater ark because Jesus is that thing, that vehicle that God made for all those who would believe that get in. That's why the New Testament says we are in Christ. All those who are in Christ, when you're saved, you're now in Christ. What is he saying? We all get on the ark of Christ and no matter how hard the wrath of God blows, those who are in Christ will never be touched by it. We are saved by it because our great Jesus, the ark, absorbs every bit of that for us. There's now no condemnation for us who are in Christ Jesus. Nothing can separate us from the love of God because we are in Christ. He's the greater ark. That's the gospel. So Peter's saying, get in the ark. You get in the ark of Jesus, the door is shut behind you. You don't open the door or shut it. You just hear it when it... Closes behind you. Sound effects. Amazing, right? (laughs) Jesus is the greater ark. And then he kind of brings it together in chapter 4, drips into chapter 4, 1 Peter 4, 1 through 6. Since therefore Christ suffered in the flesh, arm yourselves with the same way of thinking. For whoever has suffered in the flesh has ceased from sin, so as to live for the rest of the time in the flesh, no longer for human passions, but for the will of God. For the time that is past suffices for doing what the Gentiles want to do. Living in sensuality, passions, drunkenness, orgies, drinking parties, and lawless idolatry. With respect to this, they are surprised. I'd love if you would underline, they are surprised. It's a very important thing we're going to come back to. He says, with respect to this, they are surprised when you do not join them in the same flood of debauchery and they malign you. But they will give an account to him who is ready to judge the living and the dead. For this is why the gospel was preached even to those who are dead, 
that though judged in the flesh the way people are, they might live in the spirit the way God does. Okay, so let's take a look at what Peter is kind of saying here to us. The first thing is he's, he wants us to look at Jesus. And since Jesus suffered and it produced so many wonderful things, suffering's going to produce wonderful things for us. And he says, Jesus suffered, we need to have the same mindset. What mindset? We need to not be afraid of it. We need to lean in, not lean out. We need to ask, what are you doing, God? Not why are you letting this happen? The victory of Jesus in suffering gives us confidence in our own suffering. We have to keep looking back to Jesus. He suffered too. When we go through hard things, he did too. And and it bore great fruit, and it will for us too. Every time it will. It's his guarantee. Either God's lying, which he does not, or he's telling us the truth, which he always does. He will bless us in suffering. The next thing Peter says to the church, I love that he does not pamper them. You would think it would be all hang in there, guys. Instead, he's still preaching to them. And he tells them, he says, hey, it's time to grow up. He says, if you're still living like you did when you didn't know Jesus, like the Gentiles, and he even gives a little list, right? He says, if you're still living like that, stop. Stop living like you don't know Jesus. He says, the time has far passed for that. That time is over. You got to stop living like that. You got to live a different way. That time is over with. It's hurricane time. We got a storm coming. Stop messing around. It's time to grow up. Hard words, needed words. I think he would say the same to us. I think he would stand in front of us and he would say to teenagers, hey, if you know Jesus, stop living to be popular and cool. Stop. If you're living a way that's not for Christ, then stop. Stop living that way and live for Jesus. He'd say to adults, living for materialism and living for the next big fun vacation and living for the trifles of this world, he would say, stop. That's how the world lives. Stop. Grow up. Jesus died. He's he's the king of kings. Live like you know him. That's what he would say to us. He would challenge us. And then finally, you need to understand that he's saying Christians must choose between a life in the flesh and the spirit. You've got to choose one or the other. That's what he's saying. He's saying, you have a new life in the spirit. Don't live in the flesh. That's a battle, isn't it? Every day. He knows it. That's why he, he's telling them, hey, I know you Christians are still dealing with this. He wouldn't have said it if he didn't know they were. That's right. Even the churches around Rome under persecution weren't perfect. That's why he told them, some of y'all are suffering because you're sinning, not because of Nero. And it's true for us. And I told you to underline something that just jumped off the page at me. The word surprise. He says, they should be surprised. At what? Well, the way you live. Let's put it in proper context. He says, they, the world around the Christians, should look upon the church and their lives and be surprised by it. And that has challenged me because I've asked myself, and I would like you to, this is the closer today. Okay, Is there anything surprising about your life as a Christian that the world looks at it and goes, wow, that blows me away? Our Christian life should have an element of surprise. Whether I'm a 12-year-old, a 15-year-old, 45-year-old, or a 70-year-old, are people, when, they, when non-Christians look at the way you love people, are they blown away by it? Or do you love like everybody else? Jesus said, be salty. Peter says, be surprising. They're saying the same thing. When people look at the way you live, how joyful you are, do they go, man, where does that come from? You blow me away with your joy. It's consistent. It's not just day to day. Who are you? You're weird. Surprise. Is there anything surprising about your life and mine? I'm asking myself, does my marriage blow people away? Do they see how my wife and I treat each other and are they genuinely surprised? Wow, that's something. The way I value people, the way I live my life, and, and I'm not enough. I'm going to be honest with you, not enough. I want to be more surprising. I want you to be as well. I want us to be a surprising church where people went, go, I had no idea that's how Christians could be. Be surprising. Live in a way that is surprising. And so I would ask you today, to not be afraid of suffering, leverage it for the glory of God, 
and surprise the world around you with how you live for Jesus. Let's pray. Lord, thank you for your word. I pray that you bring it alive in our hearts for your glory. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen.